So what? So so what do you say? What do you say to women who say, "Yeah, that's that's that old school stuff. We we able to go do what we need to do. We can go have sex with whoever we want to have sex with." And I don't I don't feel no emotional soul tie to nobody. I hear a lot of women say that, but my question to them is, when you get back to your house, before you get in that shower, and you look in that mirror, do you like what you see? Do you really like what you see? That moment lives with you forever. Because sometimes, and I, I'm going to speak for myself, okay? I'm not going to speak on anyone else. Yeah. I remember being, you know, having fun mm -hmm. and coming back home, and it wasn't such a fun moment because I dealt with the gift of guilt of giving myself to someone that really didn't deserve me. And to lay down with someone and then get up and not feel anything. I can't say that that felt good. The moment felt good. But what happened afterwards stayed with me long after I'd gotten up. That person that went on about their business and sometimes went on and got married. But guess what? I'm still dealing with that hurt on the inside. You know, so they can say, well, you know, I just need me a little fun or whatever. Do you really like what you see in the mirror? Do you really like how you feel once that moment is over? Kamish, I think you just blessed somebody. I think you just set somebody free with that statement. We put porn to shame. <laughs> The womb isn't just about where I give Talk birth to babies. Talk about it. Talk. The womb is about where we give birth to purpose. Talk. I was basically all of her nevers. I never imagined my journey would inspire people all over the world. You have set a standard in love. I was dating a young lady who helped me heal. Wow. This woman is a ride or die. The conversations have really helped me to change my perspective on relationships. I had 19 attorneys at one time that were speaking into my ear. 19, 19 attorneys. Attorney. My, my, my last relationship, you know, it did a number on me. What you did not know is I had a whole little situation lined up that evening. Your transparency is literally setting people free. And you're unique. You ain't like nobody else. I, I noticed that right away. You can make me cry. <laughs> Um, thank you. I received that. Let one of them Barbie doll bodies walk over here. He gonna say, Dear future wifey. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're gonna go right in that box. <laughs> I'm Lataris R. Whitfield, and welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. I'm your host, Lataris R. Whitfield. Hey, listen, man, we've been having a lot of fun. We've been tackling some very controversial subject matter but you guys have been rolling with it i'm just wanting to provide the space to expound your thinking and as it expounds my own um but hey are you still shacking up with us come on if you're still shacking up with us go ahead and hit that subscription button and subscribe you know what we record this episode we have about a thousand uh a thousand subscribers left to hit a hundred thousand so what I'm going to say right now is by the time you see this, uh, we would have reached 100,000 subscribers. So I'm just going to say thank you, thank you, thank you for us reaching 100,000 subscribers. Uh, I greatly appreciate y'all for rocking with me for the last two and a half years. This has been nothing short of amazing. Well, today we're going to have a little fun. Oh, yeah, we're going to have a whole lot of fun. Uh, without further ado, welcome to the Dear Future Wifey podcast. My new homie, Kamish Hopkins. How you doing, sister? I'm fine. I'm fine. It's good to be here. Now, now, Kamish, a lot of people have been saying, hey, I need to have an episode that represents those in the 50 plus category. Um, would that be you? That is me. Well, see, a lot of people don't think you you, you you 50 plus. They don't think you 50 at all. No, I get uh, mistaken for 38, 39, 40, but never 50. So you have a lot of what, little young young guys trying to shoot their shots? Yes, too tender for the Roni. <laughs> <laughs> too tender for the Roni. Well, listen, y'all going to find out now. Now, I told Kamisha to be on her best behavior because uh, when I uh, talked to her the other day, she is a complete <laughs> nut. And so I'm going to see which version of her shows up today. Um, so I always choose guests that are very organic to my story, to the journey, those that apply to my past, present, or future. And I posted a video. I just, I'm new to TikTok, just got on TikTok about a week ago. And I posted a video. 
And then somehow I looked and saw one of your videos pop up. And I was like, this lady is real honest and real truthful and just really, really blunt. And uh, so I reached out to you and said, hey, listen, um, and I saw that you lived in the area. So I said, hey, listen, I think I would like to have you as a guest on the podcast. Give me a call. And in the first two minutes, I knew that I had to have you on this <laughs> podcast. Thank you. Thank you. What did I say to you in that episode? Well, not episode. What did I say to you on that phone call that uh, confirmed the reason why I wanted you on the show? Honesty. 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 Um when we first talked, the first thing that flew out of my mouth was, I don't know anything, but to be honest. And you said, hey, I don't need anything else. I'm, I'm sold. That's I'm it. sold. Uh, and you begin to tell me this hilarious story uh, <laughs> that we're going to name this episode. Tell the truth. That's right. Just tell the truth. Why so, is it so hard? So what were you talking about? So you said that when you're in these dating streets, um, you're single, right? Yes, I am. How long you been single? Um, I've been single for uh, many, many years. Um, I, I was single and didn't know it. So. What do you mean? Hold on, Kamish. You said you were single and didn't know it. What do you mean by that? When you thought you were in a relationship, but later find out that you were not. Um, I was in a relationship, but um, the other person wasn't. We was in a relationship or you were in a marriage? No, I was in a relationship. And you said you was in a relationship and you found out that the other person wasn't. Right. How'd and you find that was that 2016. Um, I found out through a friend. Through a friend. Female friend? Male yes, friend? female friend. And what did she say? Um, she said, you do know that he has a whole family, right? A whole family? I, I said, no. No, I, I don't. And um, it just went from there. So I've been single ever since. I mean, there there have been situationships. Oh, situationships. Yes. Um, you know, your friends tell you, oh, girl, just have a little fun. But I'm 50. I, I'm, I don't want fun. I want a lifetime of fun. I don't want increments of fun, mm. you know. So that's not my thing, you know. That's not something I'm interested in. Have you been married before? I have. How Very long have you been married? Probably about an hour. <laughs> Kamish, what you talking about? You were married for an hour. Um, it was a very short marriage. Um, I didn't go into the marriage um, for the right reasons. Um, I went in trying to give my son a unit, something I didn't have. Mm. And um, I knew when I said I do, I didn't. And the marriage, it was doomed before it began. So... It was very brief. Um, I saw what I wasn't going to tolerate, and I got out just as quickly as I got in. So put reference, put time, put a timetable. How long did you date said individual before you got married? Um, almost a year. Almost, almost a year. A year. Mm -hmm. And within what time did he say, I want to marry you? He didn't say. You said it? I said, if we're going to be together, we need to be married. But he was younger than me. He Young. was 11 years younger than me. He was left. So at that time, how old were you? Oh, 11 years ago. You know, my math is not that. So clear. that was just 11 years it, ago? It, yes. It, no, no, no. At the time, it was 2000. I don't even remember. But it's, it, it, it's not even something that I keep in mind. Um, it was 2000. All I remember is my divorce being final Juneteenth. That was the only thing I can remember. I can't even remember. I don't remember. I'm you don't sorry. remember when you got married. I really that's don't. That's the only thing that, men be having a problem with knowing. Not, no, you got to think it was not a marriage. That was not a marriage. See, I view marriage differently. I feel like what God has joined together, no man can destroy that. Right. God didn't join us together. Ooh. So now it's not even a part of my memory. Kamish, because God did not join us together. Kamish, you're stepping on some toes right now. I mean, that may be true, but you have to look at the dynamics of marriage. When you are standing there and you're repeating what that minister is saying to you, and when he gets to that part and he says what God has joined together, and a lot of people are joined together by history. Mm. They're joined together by children. They're joined together by security. Mm. But God is not in the midst of that. So when you see the rate of divorce because of finances, because of interference of children, stepchildren, or whatnot, God is not in that. But when God is in the marriage, that means that we can overcome and we can fight through anything together. God keeps you together. So when you are not joined by God, you can look for a divorce soon. Ooh. Kamish. It's the truth. 
To me, it's, it's the truth. Oh Lord! So we, so again, we just gonna tell the truth, huh? You gotta be honest. We gonna tell the truth. So, how long did it take you to realize that you got married for the wrong reasons? Uh, when we got home. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. When we got home you, you said, from the justice of the peace, I knew going in that it was wrong. You really did. I really did. I really knew that it, going in that it was wrong because it was not someone that fit what I needed in my life, what my son needed. And, but because I didn't want to shack. Yeah. And see, sometimes we yeah, Hold do on, stop. You hear that? She didn't want to shack. <clears throat> that means you need to subscribe. Shameless plug. Continue. I didn't want to, I didn't want to shack. And I didn't want my son to see his mother living, mm -hmm. you know, with a man and not be married. That's not yeah. the image I wanted to give him. But I also didn't want to give him the image of divorce either. So, I mean, it's so much wrapped into that. And come on, let's unpack that because I want to understand that. Because you said as soon as you got home, you knew y'all shouldn't be married. But then, how long did it take for you to make the decision to say, let's go and dissolve this? Um, a few months. Uh, we got married in September. I do remember that. By November, it started to crumble. Um, and it was a lot wow. of outside interference from his children's moms. Um, a lot of you know, that thing going on. I felt he was being very dishonest. And I am, I'm a private person to a certain extent. In my home, my home is my castle. And if I feel that my home has been violated by the one that's in the home, then now I have to remove you from the home and protect my peace. Yeah. Yes. And what was that conversation like? Um, That conversation came, um, it came by because of an incident, um, something he heard in the home that he took outside of the home. Oh, yeah. And it got back to me. And I told him, I said, I can't live like this. Yeah. I said, I cannot sit here and be in my own house and not be able to speak freely. And I have to worry about you carrying things outside of the home. There's no peace there. There's yeah. no maturity there. And I knew, I knew at that moment, I said, this is not something I'm going to stay in. 11 year difference. Did you hear a lot of stuff from your family or friends saying I heard a young? lot from his his side. When I say his side, his mother was against it. And I understand, you know, now that I'm a mom, yeah. you know, her being against it, but looking back at it, it could have been really it could have been a good marriage had he had the tools to be a good husband. But because of the immaturity that I didn't see until the marriage, then this is not yet a man. You see what I'm saying? This is still a little boy. So how old was he when you got married? Oh, God. Um, he was 30. He was, what, 31, 32? Yeah, 31, 32, somewhere like that. Do you think there's a certain age? What's too... What's too young to get married as far as the oldest to be uh, the oldest too young? So let's say is 25 too young to get married or is it very, do you believe it's based on the individual? I, I believe that it's based on the individual and their maturity level because I've seen people young get married and, and grow old and still be married. But then I've seen people get married too prematurely and mm -hmm. divorced instantly. And so it, it depends on the individual. I can't speak for the next person. So I don't know the mental of everyone, you know, I know what mine is. So it just depends on the individual. We talk about tools. That's one of the things that um, in a TED talk that I did last year, um, I believe highly in tools that we never get any type of uh, manual to marriage. You know, we just jump into a marriage and we try to figure it out. And, and you said something so so important that I didn't believe he had the tools and you understand the gravity of those vows. You went back to the vows and you talked about how God and then the Bible says what well, God had joined together that no man put asunder. Yes. But, um, and, and the reason why I say you stepped on some toes is because we always want God to bless mess. And then God, so, so you knew, which is interesting. You knew this is a person you shouldn't marry. Got married. As soon as you got home, it, <laughs> affirm the reason why you shouldn't have married him in the first place. Right. I knew, I knew going in that it was wrong. I knew. And I, 
my focus was my son. I just didn't want to shack up. I didn't want to do so that. So you wanted your son to have what? A unit. I wanted him to have, if he's going to see a man in the house, it was he was going to see a, a husband. He was going to see a father figure, a husband. He was not going to see a boyfriend in and out because there are things that I don't do around my child. Yeah. And I respect myself, my home, and my child. So I didn't want him to have the wrong things growing up. And I still ended up giving him divorce. So what was it a situation that you were in that caused you to have to move in with, you know, for y'all to have to move in? No, it's just that we were we were dating and the, the relationship, it was progressing. He was living with his mom, you know, and we were together a lot. And I just moved back from Texas um, at the time and I was, you know, getting ready to relocate. And so I finally got in the house and everything and then I met him um, maybe about six months in and we started and it went on about almost a year. And then I was like, you know what? I said, if we're going to be together, we, we're going to have to be married, you know? And that was it. And then that was it. <laughs> and that was it. But you know, I don't, I don't regret it because it, it made me a better person moving forward. It made me understand what other mothers go through when they're dealing with their children. Mm -hmm. And an older woman comes in. Now I know because I'm a mom, you know, and I can extend some grace yeah. to someone if my son chooses to date an older woman, you know. And I still feel like I have provided him the tools to become the man that he would need to be in a marriage because I'm teaching him, you know, integrity. I'm teaching him, you know, respect, you know, he's seen these things. We talk about a lot of things. He's an only child. I don't call him the man of the house. He is my son. Thank you. 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 Why do you think I'm saying thank you? Because so many women, single mothers use that term when addressing their sons. I tell my son, you are my son. These are the things that I expect of you because you are my son. I will never tell him he's the man of the house because when I when you say man of the house, the man of the house sleeps with the, the woman exactly. of the house. That's not going to happen. So I'm not going to give my, my child that title because the man of the house has responsibilities outside of what a child, he has chores. My child has chores. My husband has responsibilities. They're two different things. Now, some may say, well, the chores are responsibilities that may be in your household, but more in that grass and washing them little dishes and, and washing his sheets, those are his chores. Now, the responsibility of the husband is making sure that the home is, is run well. That is not a responsibility for a child. The reason why I believe that a lot of men grow up with a lot of trauma is because they're operating as the quote unquote man of the house when they are supposed to be experiencing childhood. And exactly. then they get older and then they start reverting to childish ways. Exactly. And then they start trying to relive what they lost in their childhood. Exactly. I believe that that's caused so much trauma in the black community because we've had to grow up a whole lot faster than we were supposed to. Exactly. And that's why I want to applaud you, Queen, on understanding the, the difference and distinguishing the two to say, no. You have responsibilities as a husband. You have chores as a as a as my son, yes. and you're not the man in the house. Because then what happens is is that now when you start uh, dating, dating, then that young boy feels like he has a say so, right? You know, and, and he you walks, don't. Yeah, you walk up though looking like uh, who is this man, yeah. Mama? Where are you going, son? You are not in a position to question me. I'm the adult here, and that is what is in my household because I don't ever want him to feel like he has the responsibilities of worrying about bills. I want you to worry about getting your dribble together yeah. out there on that basketball court. I want you to be worried about, you know, are you going to make good grades? I th that's where your focus needs to be. He asked me about bills one time. I said, son, that's not your worry. Mm. I said, that's not your worry. I said, we've never been in the dark and we've never been hungry. I said, and you've never been naked until you came into the world. 
I said, so that is not your responsibility. How old is he? He's 16, about to be 17. Is he a really uh, good, responsible young man? He's a good kid. Yeah. He's a good kid. He's a, he's about as hard-headed as the rest of the children mm -hmm. out here in the world. And he's he has that I know syndrome, you know. I know. So do you I think know. it's different? Because, you know, you know, each generation I always say, we, you know, the generation – we ain't like my parents was like we wasn't as bad as you and then i look at my kids like now we wasn't as bad as y'all do you do you well, feel like <laughs> my thing is this i look at my age and my age group and i look at my son what the difference is is that they do not have the mentality that we have we had what we call a go-getter mentality. Yes. We wanted to get out and explore. We wanted to have our own. These children have no get up and go about themselves. That's what I was they my son. are spoiled. They want what they want when they want. They want to microwave everything. Yes. They want to microwave uh, turning 16. They want to microwave hanging out with their friends. I can't let you do that. You know, you're not responsible enough. You've not shown me the responsibility in the house and the things that I asked you to do for me to put you out there in the world because you're not displaying that. And so I remember being young and my mom trusted me to go here and there and I was responsible. I trust him to go somewhere. You're losing your phone. You're losing your earbuds. You can't keep up with your keys. So no, they're not ready for they don't move the way that we did. Yeah. I remember moving out and never looking back. Yep. I'm afraid Same for me. him to leave, leave home. Same with me. I'm just, a, now you have the average 19 or 20 year old is really 14 at heart. Yep. You know, they're not ready for what's out here. That's reassuring because I just thought it was my, my, my kids. I was like, I was like, what? In they the have world? a tribe. Yeah. Cause I was like, I said, you comfortable like this summer, you ain't working. You ain't doing nothing. I keep telling you, you need to get you a job. I keep giving you deadlines. And it's like, I said, how do you feel comfortable like that? Like, because just he can always turn the light switch and the lights come on. He can always turn the water on and it's hot or cold. He can always open the refrigerator and there is something to eat. And if he needs to go somewhere, guess what? He can always get there. So yes, he's very comfortable. Well, I'm going to turn off his side of the house. I'm going to turn off his room. That's not going to no gonna happen. That's he's not going gonna to happen. He's going to be like, why the lights don't work on this side? Break break off. That's what we did. But but what I'm learning is um, I'm looking at my 16-year-old, and he's standing 6'5", and, and he's mistaken, you know, as being older. But that mentality is, is so tender. It's so young. I want to make sure that he has everything that he needs when he's ready to go. So I don't want him to leave prematurely. I cannot have someone in my life that does not understand that my son is not mature enough to be out yet. I will not have a man in my life that tells me, hey, your son has to get out of here. Um, sir, you're someone's son, and you think that you're going to stand in this house and my son is not, you're going to be the one to go. <laughs> because my son has to show me that he's responsible enough to exit the door. Is there an age? Because um, think about it, would you have a 30-year-old uh, man still sitting up doing the same thing? I don't think that. I can't speak for everyone else, but I know that my son would not be 30 years old and in my house. But would you allow it if it was? Um, if he had some mental issues. Yeah. Uh, that would have to be the case. There's some mental issues going on. Son, do you need some help? Uh, do I need to get, do you need somebody to talk to? Because you, you should have been gone, you know. But I don't think it'll be that, you know, because I'm going to. Help him get on out, you know. I'm going to support him with finding his own place and furnishing, you know, things like that. I just can't see myself saying, hey, when you get 18, you know, what we yeah. were told. 18, you know, out. when you get 18, you got to get out of my house. You know, we were drilled. That was drilled in us. But I look at the parents that put their children out, and those children are suffering. Those children are on drugs. Those children are being abused. Young girls are being, you know, taken advantage of. And the young boys, the same. I can't see myself putting my child out and he's not ready. And, you know, when you when you have a prayer life and you have um, God in your life, I think back to the prodigal son. And he let his child go and he partied and he had a good time. Mm -hmm. And when he was done spending and the world had hit him some licks, he went back and said, Dad. I want to come home. And his father greeted him with open arms. We have to extend our children that grace, mm -hmm. the same grace that we ask God to extend us. 
You've been through a lot of gracious moments that God has shown you so much grace. Um, I'm going to ask an open-ended question and just see what you say. When you look at moments over your life and you say God extended grace for me in this, what's, what's one of the most significant things that you've gone through that you've experienced God's grace? Being diagnosed with breast cancer. That's what I want you to say. Um, having my breasts removed. Going through the mental of that um, and still in that moment not understanding God, why me? And why do I have to go through this? You know, being a cheerleader for my friends that had gone through it and I'm rooting for them, mm -hmm. but I still had breast on my chest. And then now the ball landed on me and I'm going through that. But God, he was so amazing to be diagnosed and then go to your first oncology visit and to be told that the only cancer you had was in your biopsy. You were cancer free the day that you had your biopsy. And it was devastating because I had gotten my breast removed and I could have kept my breast, but the doctor said you would have to go through a couple of bouts of radiation. So when I speak of God's grace, how he regulated my mind during that time to live a year without breast, to look at myself and not feel beautiful, to wonder if any man would accept me this way to go through reconstruction three times to have scars from left to right and then turn around and have alopecia. Now you're a bald headed, breastless woman and God still showed, you know, his love and his grace and to be a voice, to be transparent to allow people to see me breastless, to allow people to see me bald, and to walk in everything that I've been through and know that no matter what anyone thinks of me, God still sees beauty and he still loves me. Why are you? Why were you so open on your TikTok? Uh, for th those that don't know, Kamisha is a, is a <laughs> budding TikTok star. <laughs> Oh, my uh, goodness, you're too kind. Yeah, she got about <laughs> a quarter of a million uh, followers on TikTok. Um, what made you go to TikTok and be so transparent? Um, it was during COVID. We were in the house, and I was pretty much still watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> and um, my friend said, you know what? You ought to get on TikTok. And I was like, girl, I barely know how to work the computer. <laughs> and she said, you should get on TikTok. So it started out just dancing, and I was just doing my thing and I was just I was so TikTok crazy I was in there asleep I went and bought a little microphone <laughs> I spray painted it I started singing songs I was like oh my god I can sing all the songs I want to you know <laughs> and then it was the skits and, the, and then um, I ended up talking about you know me and relationships and then the people started to come I mean and do you I, remember the first video that started drawing people in like, where, um, where did it change? You know, you may get some trickle here and now, there. Now, the first, the first video that I put on TikTok, it went viral. Oh, really? The first one? The first one, it was me being a little girl, and, um, <laughs> and I had my little hair in braids or whatever. But then the first one that really just took me into that where people noticed me was my Trump videos, my <laughs> comedy with Donald Trump. What you do? And I was, I was calling them D. You know, D, look, you got to leave that White House. D, you got to come on out of there now. D, come on. D, it, you know, the, the, the Rush Limbaugh thing, you know, when I made the statement that, hey, he died during Black History Month. How about that? Look at God. Won't he do it? Oh, I got so much about that. But then I did a video. The one that got the most views was when I spoke to young ladies about, um, I said, you may not even listen to me. I said, but um, when you are out here dating, you need to really be with someone that accepts you. Stop trying to get with people that don't accept you. And I spoke about, you know, being a young girl and always being with people, you know, that thought they would find someone better.
you know, and just not really knowing about relationships because my mother, I was born in the 70s and my mother didn't talk to me about relationships and what a woman was supposed to do and how you're supposed to carry yourself. I was just always told, you better not never, I better not never find out you, you're having sex, doing, you know, mm -hmm. those type of things. Mm -hmm. I was always, you better not, you better not. But it was never what a woman should do, a young lady should do. And so I told, you know, of that, and it went viral. And then... Viral to the tune of how many views? You remember? Um, about 650, 620 to 50, somewhere around there. 1,000. Make sure you say 1,000. Yes, 620,000. Make sure you say 620,000. Make sure and then... Viral? Yes, and then um, <laughs> the next viral video was when I allowed them to see my alopecia. Yep. And I didn't know that there were so many women that suffered from alopecia, but what I wanted them to see was you don't have to hide behind these outdated old looks. And even with the look that I have now, I have alopecia, but I'm going to rock Looking something. Fly. I'm going to rock something really cute. And, yeah. and I want everything that I put on my head. I want my clients to be able to say, I want that. And even though their their head may look like yours, mm -hmm. it can look like this as well. <laughs> so mm -hmm. when I came here, I, I wasn't expecting this. You know, I said, you know, I didn't do weave. I didn't. That was not my area. And when I got here and I, I remember I was telling a friend, I said, look, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know. I don't, I'm not going back to Mississippi. I said, I don't know what to do. And I remember praying one night. And um, I'd watched a video, and it was the the football player, and he had had this fight fight with um his girlfriend. Oh yeah, that one. And I couldn't sleep because I had been abused. I had been physically abused too, in a previous relationship, and um I couldn't sleep. And I just began to pray, and I said, Lord, I said, What am I gonna do? How am I gonna get people to come to me? And I heard the spirit of the Lord say, Sit in your own seat. And I said, Man, I don't want to do my own hair. The voice said, sit in your own seat. The next day I got up, I went and I had one client, did that one, and I started working on myself. And I would put snippets. I would record myself with those snippets. And I did my first quick weave, and I never did anything like that. And it was so beautiful. And I went home, and I put on a little shirt and freshened up my makeup, and I, I showed all of me. And that video went viral. And I started crying. I had um, a guy, um, he's the stylist to the stars, um, stylist Jay Bolin. Oh, yeah. He reached out to me. He's from Mississippi. And he said, congratulations, you did it. He said, I look to see you in a lot of places. And that started it. And my phone was ringing off the hook. I couldn't I couldn't so sleep. Clients? clients. And I was just overwhelmed because I looked at the things that I had been through. Teach. And all of those steps led me back to here. For I know all things work together for the good of them that love God and to the called according to his purpose. That's right. That's when you get that 2020 vision to see. And it only comes from a rear view perspective. You look back and go, okay, But God. the key is obedience. Yes. Because when he said, sit in my seat. own seat, yeah. I had to sit there. Because I was going around giving her free hairstyles. I was going around passing out cards, literally begging people to come and sit in my chair. I said, just let me do your hair and, you know, you can spread the word. They would come and get a free hairstyle and they wouldn't return. And my friend said, girl, stop going out there giving away free stuff. You too good for that. And when God said, sit in your own seat, let them see you do your own hair. I didn't understand what was about to happen, but because of my obedience, God opened a door that no one could shut. And so people have been sitting in that chair ever since. And we take a little dip during the hot seasons. But, you know, I prayed before I got here. And I said, Lord, you know, I said, let this open the door for other things. I said, let this open the door to bless my finances, to bless my spirit, to bless my mental, just every area of my life, to even bless my son. Mm. Let him be connected to the right people through whatever I walk through. And so my faith in God is strong. And a lot of people don't see that. Yeah, I got the little curse and spirit sometimes. <laughs> but you know what? At the end of the day, when it's time for me to speak into someone's life, when it's time for me 
to pray for someone, even myself, when it's time for me to lay hands on Kamish. I know how to get on my knees and seek God's face. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So, that's beautiful. I love when you say sit in your own seat. That's what God told me during COVID. Um, he told me to make, because, you know, I do a lot of video production for a lot of school districts around here and um, along with other clients. And when COVID hit, everybody was just like, hey, it's just everything shut down. Mm -hmm. I was like, uh-oh, my money done shut down. Yeah. And then God said, make you your own client. And when wow. he told me that, that's why I launched the podcast. Wow. He said, make you your own client. And April the 15th, I launched this podcast. Amazing. And it's been the most Obedience. powerful thing. Obedience. Obedience. And I hate when I tell you, Kamish, it's, it's, you you good at just sitting in front of a phone and talking to a phone and whatever. Me, I can't just sit there and just talk to, when no one is there. So it was very challenging. I know you can. <laughs> you do an exceptional job doing it. I'll be like, God, Thank I don't you. know how to do that. And then God said, the tears, edit edit what you don't like out just edit it right. so then the first couple of episodes that's what it was just me just talking and i was just so uncomfortable even when i look back at it i can see my own <laughs> my own comfort level I was but like, I was you scared. had to take those steps gotta and once you take those steps each step gets better and better and better it's just like a newborn facts when their little knees lock in and connect yep they're able to take that first step yep but that first step is a little wiggly mm -hmm. and they kind of shift left to right and they wobble and you, oh goodness. But then they start walking straight and now they have to elevate themselves. Now mm. they're riding a bike yep. and guess what? You're still holding them yep. and they're still wiggling to the side. And guess what? You're still holding them and now they have to elevate themselves. Now they're driving a car yep. and you're sitting on the passenger side with your stomach in knots. <laughs> But you're still guiding them. Yeah. And that's how I look at God each step of my life. He has guided me. Even when I was wiggly and I didn't know which way I was going to fall, he caught me and he guided me and he continues to guide me. Kamish, where does this, this, this old nice radio voice come from? Because when I was on the phone with you at first, you, you sounded. Because listen, nah, you, 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 know you, you have to in any environment. <laughs> You have to adjust to the environment. You have to. And so there is a time and a place and a season for everything. And on the phone, I was ha ha he he. Uh -huh. But now when we are out here with people <laughs> that I can connect to, be it business, be it laughter or whatever, you all may need me. Yeah. And I, I may need you. Look for me. Cause I'm going to look for you. There it they is. may need me. There it is. So it's no time for that. It's a time and a place for that. And this is not it. So I may throw a little joke here and there, but it's about business right now. <laughs> it's about business. Well, we have to grow you. You have to grow me. We have to work together. So we can't, we can't be in here, you know, uh, lollygagging around now. Kamisha was acting. Man, she was so funny. I was dying <laughs> laughing. I didn't think I was going to be able to do an interview with you. I was like. I told you you would be. I told you you would be because I know that I, I, I laugh a lot, but when it comes down to the series, especially when it's God's business. There's a whole different person that walked in here. I was like, who is this person? That is a, when I tell you when it comes to the Lord and speaking of him, I don't take it as a laughing matter. Mm. I don't, I don't take it as a joke. I take it very seriously. Now, God has been funny with me because when he told me to sit my little lazy self in my own seat, he knew I didn't want to. But I felt like he was testing me in the area of obedience. Mm. And so when I was obedient, I was rewarded. And so that is, that is why I'm here now and I'm so studious. And I'm just, you know, it's not time it's for that. I'm studious. studious. I am. And I, I thank you, you know, for giving me this opportunity. I didn't know it was going to happen so fast, but that's just how God works. We connected you know? well. That was sad. less than 24 hours. Yeah, 24 <laughs> hours. That's Sunday. I talked to you and here it is. In Monday. less than 24 hours. And I told you, I said, I left a comment on your thing. And I said, why couldn't I have met him still single? And he said, I've been watching your stuff. I need to connect with you. And yep. you reached out to yep. me. And, and here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so that I was really drawn to what you were saying because a lot of people miss what the role of male is. Talk about that. So the video you're re you're referring to is what video? The video where you said that you will take if a woman is with me, 
then I got her. Yeah. She doesn't have to worry about that. Um, people don't understand the role of man. Really, males don't understand their own role. Right. They've Society has allowed them to um, get into whatever they want to get into, all these other beliefs or whatever. But the male, the role of male will never change. Talk about He's it. He's the head. Yeah. He's the leader. He is the provider. Yes. He is the one that sets everything in motion. And so when you talk about submission and allowing someone to lead you, I need to know who's leading you. And I need to know that you are man enough to hold this position and do what you're supposed to do. Because when you do what you're supposed to do, you can ask me to go up there and turn the moon off. <laughs> and I'm going to go and call NASA and say, look, um, NASA, my husband want me to go up here and turn this moon off. When y'all leaving again? Now, see, that's the comedy. But yeah. I'm serious. Because when you are in a relationship, and I'm not talking this dating thing, this yeah. boyfriend, this girlfriend, because you have to understand, you will never find find the word boyfriend or girlfriend coming out of God's mouth. Yep. You will never find that. So when you sitting up here trying to get all these boyfriends and girlfriends to work, it's not because what, what only matters is the marriage. The marriage is what matters. So if he is on his knees and he is seeking God's first, God first, and I know who is leading him, I'm his closest shadow. I'm closer to I'm closer than his shadow because I'm like, baby, did you pray about it? Talk about it. Did you did, did you did, did we need to join hands? Yeah, we, preach. We, did you do that? We, we going we going. My husband said we going. He didn't talk to the Lord about it and he didn't okay it. Teach. But when you are not that leader, mm -hmm. I can't follow you. But you want me to be submissive. But you don't even pay your bills on time. Talk about it. You want me to be submissive to you and you don't even know how to communicate with me. How can I? Do you understand what submission is? Because if you are treated right, trust me, I'll go to the ends of the earth with you. I have no problem when I'm being told the truth, when I'm being respected, when I'm being honored, when I'm being loved. And when I feel safe, guess what? I operate in a whole different arena because guess what? This is mine. I know that I'm not being talked about when I step outside this mm. door. I know that I'm being protected when I step outside of this door. I know that this man is not speaking ill. I know that he's not doing all kind of things that would make us look bad in God's eye. Not just mine, not to your mama, to your daddy, to your children, but to God. And see, when that happens, when that man is under that rule, the woman, she's like putty in his hands. It was a video that I did that went viral that says the number one need for a woman is to feel safe. And that video got like 1.2 million from my page. And then other people posted it. They get 800,000 views true. and all that. And you just hit the nail on the head that when a woman feels safe, you got her. She's like, put it in your hands. And she had, but she has to witness that. Yeah. It cannot be, um, you can't go through my phone. You know, that, that rule that came about when they start doing picture texting and texting, you know, before that happened, nobody was concerned about a phone. You lay that phone anywhere. <laughs> now they put texting on their phone. They pictures. That's my privacy. That you, that, that's my, what, did, what, what, what is that about? Um, if we're together, there are no secrets. Yes. You know, I know husband and wives that share each other phones. Yeah, me too. And that should never be a problem. What is in there that's so important that you don't want me to see? So when you are living under those things, <laughs> there are going to be problems. Yeah. If I can't call you and ask you where you are, why you keep calling me? What you keep <laughs> calling me for? I ain't got to tell you where I'm going. I ain't got. That's where problems It come. is a problem. Someone can't tell you where you at. You already know I that's mean, a And so fact. those, I don't feel safe with you. And a woman knows when a woman has given a part of her to you, She's connected to your spirit. Mm -hmm. So you can be out here and over here in Cozumel and she can be on in the hot state of Texas. Yeah. And you can be with another woman and her spirit. will recognize it. will let you know something is off. Something is off about you. 
But people don't realize that. And they, oh, you just too nosy. You just know it's not that I'm connected to you. The moment you touched me, I became connected to you. And everybody that you touch, you're connected to. And so now you, you're, you're dealing in all of this and you're trying to be one with somebody, but you're still connected to other people. I can't, I can't. So, I, so, I, so what do you say? What do you say to women who say, yeah, that's, that's that old school stuff. We, we able to go do what we need to do. We can go have sex with whoever we want to have sex with. And I don't, I don't feel no emotional soul tie to nobody. I hear a lot of women say that, but my question to them is, when you get back to your house, before you get in that shower and you look in that mirror, do you like what you see? Do you really like what you see? That moment lives with you forever. Because sometimes, and I, I'm going to speak for myself, okay? I'm not going to speak on anyone else. Yeah. I remember being, you know, having fun. Mm-hmm. And coming back home and it wasn't such a fun moment because I dealt with the gift of guilt of giving myself to someone that really didn't deserve me. And to lay down with someone and then get up and not feel anything. I can't say that that felt good. The moment felt good. But what happened afterwards stayed with me long after I'd gotten up, that person had went on about their business and sometimes went on and got married. But guess what? I'm still dealing with that hurt on the inside, you know. So they can say, well, you know, I just need me a little fun or whatever. Do you really like what you see in the mirror? Do you really like how you feel once that moment is over? Kamish, I think you just blessed somebody. I think you just set somebody free with that statement. I, I always know those moments, those key moments in the episodes that people, they get, like it's somebody crying right now in this moment. It's, some, it's, some, it's somebody that just got finished having one of those moments with somebody and they're feeling empty and you just provided context. To and you free. will continue to feel empty as long as you lay down and you keep getting up by yourself. When you stop and you look at yourself, and I tell people all the time, stop letting people tell you that your situation measures your value and your worth. What When I was being beat and kicked and spit on, I loved me, but I liked the way he made me feel. But as I got older, I had to look at Kamish and say, you know what? It's not just about a feeling because I can do without this feeling. Because I want more. I desire more. Because I know what this feeling is going to be. The end results are going to be the same. I know what this is going to be. I'm going to be sitting here. I'm going to be crying. I'm going to be drinking wine. I'm going to be listening to music, eating ice cream and crying. And probably dialing his number and he's not answering. Mm. And now, um, why didn't you answer my call? Like, I thought you were coming by. And I'm not going to inflict that on me. Because I want something more. And if it means being alone, then I'll be alone. Because I've laid down enough. I've laid down enough. I'm still, I'm still good. But I've laid down enough. And sometimes, women, you have to ask yourself, have you laid down enough? Haven't you laid down enough? You got to be tired of getting up and getting the same response. And you think just because you lay down when you get up, it's going to be something different. It's not still not going to make him want you still not going to make him marry you. You can't lay down enough and make a man marry you. Woo! And that's the truth. You can't lay down enough and make him get up and want to marry you. So you have to ask yourself as a woman, Am I tired yet? Am I tired yet? And I can't speak for men because I'm not a man. But as a woman, are you tired yet? Are you tired yet? Kamisha, you woke up and chose violence today, huh? No, I just chose a little light battle. <laughs> just a little light battle. Just a light battle? Just a little light battle because as women, 
We have to talk to each other and yes. we have to tell each other, look, sis, stop doing yourself like that. Take some time for you. Let yourself breathe a little. Let some wind blow in your hair. You know, you don't always have to have somebody by your side. You don't always have to have somebody in your bed. You know, take a break. It's okay. I, I don't desire to be single, but I am single. I have had my fun. I'm not bashing any women or beating up any, calling anybody out on anything. But Kamisha's tired. I don't want to be that, you know. And men may say, well, nobody wants a washed up woman. Or da, da, da. Baby, we're not washed up. Trust me, we're not washed up. I may be 50, but I remember going, and, and the doctor gave me such a good report. Baby, we're not washed up. Teach, teach. He, he did. He gave me such a good report. So we're not washed up. If anything, they will wash out before we be washed up. And that's the truth. So to have that woman still deal with you and and, and the, the noodle is still a noodle and she loves you, um, everybody better get in shape. Everybody. Everybody, because guess what? The clock is not ticking just for me. It's ticking for you as well. So what you saw in the mirror 10 years ago, you don't see that today. So sure don't. Okay, and you can take all the supplements you want. You can do all of that. But at the end of the day, the thing that's most important to me is companionship. Having somebody to hold my hand. And just sit there with me and talk and laugh. Because after a while, ain't neither one of us going to work. So what are we going to have? I'd rather have the companionship of somebody that I know loves my company, loves to hear my voice, and not just lay me down and get up and go and be with somebody else. And that's it. You okay? <sighs> Cause I know what this is doing. I, I I I always see the spiritual ramifications of stuff. I I I I'm so in tune to this podcast that I know when people show up and it's God ordained and like you said, it just happened 24 hours ago. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't even on TikTok. People kept asking me to get on TikTok. I said I don't need another social media <laughs> platform to manage. I don't need. And what is all that TikTok stuff? I don't got time for all that. It ain't nothing but people dancing all the time. I just thought TikTok right, was people dancing, right. but it's so much more. It is. And, and I was like, I just don't have time. But then people started reposting my content on TikTok, and people were like, Hey, here's your video on TikTok. Hey, here's your video on TikTok. Hey, this lady's got two hundred thousand views on your video. And I was like, Wow, okay, well, cool. Mm. You know. And then, and then. Uh, Somebody the last week said, get on TikTok. And I said, let me go look. And I just started posting videos on there because I I look at TikTok as an opportunity, another arm of advertising mm -hmm. for my YouTube channel and whatnot. But it's so much more because God allowed me to meet you. I was never going to meet you had I not gotten on TikTok. And you're right. literally right down. How about how far did you live from the studio? Um, Ten minutes. Ten minutes away <laughs> Ten from my studio. Minutes. Ten minutes. Divine Connections. We talked about that yesterday. Um, I had gotten offered, you know, other people have reached out to me to join their podcast. But God didn't say yes. And I believe in being connected to the right people because I know if I sit at somebody's feet and their area is tainted, their name is tainted. I'm connected to that now. Mm. Oh, I remember when you were on that lady. So, no, <laughs> I don't. Uh-uh. So I've turned down some people, you know. Yeah. But I told you, what did I say? I said, I let God lead me. I let that. him lead me. You I let that. him direct me. And I felt a peace about this one. There was no hesitation, you know. And I was like, okay, Kamish, this is, I think this will be good. And I said, Lord, what, what do you think? And God said, Go. And so I knew when I came that I asked him to regulate this tongue of mine. <laughs> Help me to give a word, the right word, oh, you, you. to speak life into somebody. Because I've been through a lot, and a lot of women will not admit what they've been through. Yeah, I know what it's like to be kicked. I know what it's like to be beat beyond recognition. I know what it's like to have my breasts removed. I know what it's like to be bald. I know what it's like to be a single mother, you know? And I know that it's not the end of the world for me. 
So with all of that being said, God places you where you can grow, even when you're the seed still in the packet, not knowing who's going to pick you up and who's going to plant you and where you will grow. So I allow myself to be planted where God says, this is where I want you to grow. This is where I want you to grow. Because guess what? I can't grow everywhere. If it's too many weeds, it's going to shut me out. So I allow God to place me where I can grow. And if it's grow for an hour, if it's grow for a few months, I take that lesson with me on to the next place that I can grow. So what have you been experiencing in these dating streets? What kind of guys have you been meeting? I have met guys that just aren't simply just aren't honest about what they want. I'm looking at the dating apps as more of a, to me, it's a sex pool. Right. You know, and I haven't been intimate with any, you know, none of that. So um, I just look at it as just trash. And you meet, you'll meet some okay people, but everybody is into games. And I've met people that grown men lie about their age, lie about what they have going on. And I'm like, why they lying about the age? Like I met one guy. He said he was fifty eight years old. He was actually sixty four. Um, I met one guy that um, he. I guess I just wasn't what he was looking for. But I, I don't know. And later found out that one of my friends had dated him five years ago, and he ghosted her. And um, she was in a state of. Um, I was wondering about him, and I felt a certain type of way. I said, "Hey, you shouldn't feel any type of way." He was 50 when he did it to you. He's 55 when he did it to me. He's still doing the same thing. I said, so it has nothing to do with us. And it's just people that are, they're looking for I what I feel the men my age, I'm 50. The men my age are looking for women that are 30. They're looking for women in their 20s. Um, 50 is too old for them. And... 20, 30 is too young for them. And that's the, that's where they get played. That's where you get all the negativity about, Oh, the, you women, this, that no, <laughs> sir, you went out there and tried to date your daughter's friend. And exactly. this is how it turned out for you. And now you're angry at everyone. You should really go and look at yourself because did you think your daughter's friend would want another daddy? Mm-hmm. No. And so that's what I have I've gotten, and then I sometimes I think, you know, I have a head tattoo, you know. I had alopecia, and it was a blank canvas, and I just started drawing on it, and I like my look, and I know that I'm not for everyone, but I know what I bring to the table, and it has nothing to do with finances. It has nothing to do with um what my credit score is because at the end of the day, if I can't lay my hand on my husband, and speak life into him, speak healing over his life, then I don't need anything else because money can't buy that. Talk about it. Money can't buy the spirit that a man needs from a woman, a good woman. When your husband is going through something and he is, you're you're noticing that the way he moves is different. And when he lays in the bed at night, if I can't lay my hand on his back and say, Lord, I ask that you touch this man. Lord, I don't know what he's going through, but God, I ask that you touch him, heal him, Lord, regulate his mind. If I can't do that for that man, I feel like I'm worthless. And that's where my value comes in. That's what I bring to the table. I bring a prayer life. I bring a connection Because if I'm connected to God, you're connected to God. We're connected to that man. So that means when you get to the point and you say, hey, I need a break. My God is telling me to back away. I got this. And a lot of women don't understand that you have to allow that man his time with God. Because there are things that you cannot fix. Only God can fix. And if you don't allow him that time. He's not going to be good for you. He's going to resent you at some point because he needs to be cleansed 
and you can't clean them. So I know what I bring. And I know that when God sends me a husband, he will be blessed. Our home will be blessed. Our children will be blessed. Our grandchildren will be blessed. We will be blessed. And so. Do you ever hear that? Do you ever hear guys your age ask you the question, what do you bring to the table? Yes. Um, I heard I heard it a lot, but my son's father is the seven-figure man. And he never asked for any of that. He didn't care what I had. You know, he didn't care. It was nothing to him. He just wanted that young girl, you know, no children. Um, I had a degree from Jackson State. I was just a hairdresser. And this was a seven-figure man. And he didn't care anything about what I brought to the table. He said, I just want you to have babies. And that was it. (laughs) In his Nigerian accent. And his, yes, that was it. But um, we have a beautiful son out of that. And, you know, I just don't understand what happened and when did it become so, such a need to ask a woman what she brought to the table. If you understand the role, the role yeah. of man, yeah. um, the man, I, I could tell you, um, And I I can tie this all into a story. The story of Samson and Delilah. Teach. Okay. Um, A lot of people know about Samson in the middle of his story with Delilah. Samson was to be married to someone else before he met Delilah. And because when he went to prepare a place to receive this woman, he was going to get the table, meaning he was going to get the house He was going to look for land. He was going to look for animals. And he was going to come back and receive this woman. And when he got back, the woman was married to his friend. And Samson was devastated. And Samson left there harboring hurt from a past relationship. Oh, that's girl speech. And when he got to Delilah, Samson wasn't looking for another woman. Samson was looking for another win because he had lost previously. And when he met Delilah, he knew this woman was trying to kill him. But because he didn't want to lose, he stayed and slept with the enemy. And the thing that is so great about that story is knowing the in-between. Because when you don't heal yourself from your past, you will move in a reckless way that will cause you to lose your life in the end. And Samson's Delilah was a woman. Yes, she was pretty. Yes, she was. But Samson was so hell-bent on not losing. He never even had to tell her, you know, that the hair. It wasn't the hair. The hair was an outward symbol of the covenant that his mother had made. And so when he spoke those words, he had already shown her his heart. He was already weak at that moment. She didn't have to cut a strand of his hair. He had given her the secrets of his heart. And it's so much in that in between when you let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. When you give too much too soon, it could kill you. And Samson gave that woman after she vexed him. He said, woman, you vex me. Samson, how did you get so strong? So we know that Samson was not a bulky man because if he was a big, heavy, tall man, she had no reason. She would see his strength. Where do you get your strength? He said, my mother made a covenant that my hair is to not be cut. That was a symbol. The hair was a symbol, just like the wedding ring, is a symbol to let everyone know that I'm taken. That's a symbol. And without that symbol, infidelity, cheating, when you don't wear your ring, who knows what you are? You're looking single to me. And so that story goes back to, I don't want to lose. I can't lose again. I'm going to go anyway. I know that it's wrong. 
I don't care. I'm not going to lose. I trust you, even though I know you're trying to kill me. And it's just when we out here in these relationships, we are sleeping with people that don't mean us any good, that don't care anything about us, that not willing to provide for us, not willing to be there for us, that leave us by ourselves just the way we came, destroying everything that we have in us and leaving us broken. You just summed up. <clears throat> Ooh, you just summed up what led to this podcast, the pain that I went through that I have never revealed and shared in detail um, that led. I'm, a, I'm writing a movie to really unpack and go behind the podcast and let people know what led to this. Before we started recording, and I've never, I always pray with my guests, but I never say what I said to you, which is I pray that you become a puppet and that God becomes the ventriloquist and speaks through you. And so I'm sitting up here and I'm going, I done, I done pray for God to say some of this <laughs> stuff that you're saying to me and it's messing me up right now. Oh my goodness. I'm going, I'm saying this like, I always use the story about uh, Samson and Delilah, but I never said that part. So the stuff that I always talk about is the the femininity that Delilah has. That 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 Delilah created what what Samson says he found a safe place to lay his head. So I always come from it from that standpoint. So I know it's God when you just brought in the other part, the trauma that led to Samson falling into Sam, uh, Delilah's uh, to, to mm -hmm. Delilah's lap. Mm -hmm. um, it's I, that. Woo! Like I I I I, ne I just don't remember that part of the story where he came back and she was already um, uh, married He's or there. whatnot. And it's like I said, and I remember seeing it before, and I'm like, wow, 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 because I understand as a man the trauma that follows after losing, and and and. To win, I re like I said, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna. Oh God, I'm gonna say this. Like I said, I'll never talk about that situation in detail, but I will say because you're speaking prophetically, and I gotta give God glory for this. I stayed in that situation for three years because I didn't want to lose. Mm. Mm -hmm. I knew that that situation was destroying me. Ooh. I knew that situation. I was losing myself. Mm. I was broken. Mm -hmm. I was crying. Every time I opened my eyes, tears would fall mm. down my face, mm -hmm. and I said, "But I can't lose. Mm. I can't lose." I lost a wife. I, I, I'm going through this other situation. I got to win. Mm. I got to win in this situation. Mm, look at God. And, and, and God kept saying, let it go. I said, no, I can't lose again. And I knew that that situation was destroying me. That's why I had to just sit back and just let the Holy Spirit speak through you. Thank you, Queen. You're welcome. Because You're welcome. I know that there's nobody but the Holy Spirit speaking through you. Oh, Jesus. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to give God glory. You got to give him glory. Kamish, I wasn't expecting this. I thought I would have this funny lady coming. We finna trip out because you was acting all silly on the phone. It was hilarious. I said, we're going to have a time. We're going to trip out and laugh and all that. And then you you just come as a whole, you just walked in as a prophet or something, <laughs> this bad boy. Where'd this come from? This is who I am. I mean, what you see, I share a little of this when I go live. And, but this is really who I am. This is my heart. I was raised in a house of givers. I don't know how to do anything but give. I'm a server. So it's nothing for me to bless a stranger. It's nothing for me to lend a hand to. I remember um, before I moved here, I started a foundation. Uh, um, what did you call it? Um, just a, it was called the... Um, the starter I, Dollars. Yeah, the outreach ministry or something? No, it was just a, a little... How can I put this? I did it for the high school children that were, un, that were, you know, less fortunate. And I wanted to pick out the students that didn't have the money to participate in the class reunion, not the, not the class night prom and things like that, yeah. to pay for that. And so I started a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Go for me. No, no, no. I, no, I used my own money. I did a, um, what do you do? The, the, the scholarship. I okay, did a, scholarship. Um, a starter dollars scholarship. And so I picked one of the children um, 
and I surprised him with paying for his, you know, senior night. And if he wanted to go to prom, got his things for that. And then I awarded him $500 um, from my salon. It was just my money and no, nobody helped me. And it was starter dollars. And I didn't want them to write an uh, essay because I didn't want children to be writing and putting in the time and their work and then they not get chosen. And I just went to the school and I said, is there a child here that wants to participate but just doesn't have it? And she said, yeah, we have this person. And I presented it, you know, graduation night and the lady was like well I'll get up and present it for you and the superintendent said no she's gonna present her own and I gave a word to the class and then I presented him with the money and I remember going home just last week and I saw that young man mm. and when I walked in his little job he has two little jobs and I'm so proud of him and um he said hey Miss Kamish and he just he came to me and he hugged me he said it's so good to see you he said you enjoying Texas I said yes I am he said it's so good to see you I said it's good to see that you're still here and you're still working and so to that is what I know how to do. No, to but, give, but this is something know. different. You done gave on a spiritual. You, you don't even know what you just did. I mean, that's the thing about it. You have no idea what you just did. But you're going to find out. And I'm going to tell you this right now. Because the Dear Future Wifey podcast is such a, a special platform. And I and I don't take this platform lightly because I've watched how God has been healing, uh, restoring marriages. Uh, right before we recorded this, I got a call from a friend that asked. He said, can you give me. Um, so, and this is a body I talk to maybe mm -hmm. twice a year. Mm -hmm. And he said that he and his wife are going through some things and he wanted, um, advice on a, uh, on a marriage counselor. And for when, when a man reaches out and he said, they said, it's hard for me to do this. I said, I already know <sighs> this platform is so special that it's, it's, it's creating safe spaces for people to even reach out outside the podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know what you just did. Your DM's about to blow up because you provided so much healing to women out there, men out there. You know, spoke you spoke to my soul like you you can't even imagine because it's it's God said I will use your pain for your platform. Mm -hmm. So God took the pain of what I went through and and has been blessing people all over the world, um, and you just spoke to that broken young man that bled. And every week I come on this podcast to bleed in front of people and to show my scars and say, I'm still healing. And so you did so much healing me and speaking to me. And, 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 and what I say about this is not so much about the, uh, the healing, but just being seen mm -hmm. because it's like when, when moments like this happen, it's like, God is like, I still see the tears. I still see I'm so intricate. I like people don't understand. I get a lot of people that DM me saying, Hey, I wrote this book. I want to come on the podcast. And I was like, that's not the platform for that. Okay. Well, I got, you know, I'm a motivational speaker. I want to come on the platform. I want to tell people this, 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 this. And then I go, but what's your story? Right. Cause I, this platform is not used for people to come and tell people what they need to do. Right. It's so specific i need people to be able to i want to create a safe space for people to share their own journey exactly. and as they're sharing their own journey the bible says that confess your faults one to another so that you may be healed yes. but it also says that people will overcome by the word of your testimony and by the blood of the lamb and so when you're sharing your testimony when guests come on they share their testimony people go ah oh, i'm able to overcome over this yes Yes. I, I I went through the, through breast cancer and wow, I see yes. her there. She's so beautiful. She's sitting up, I, but I'm in the hospital right now watching Dear Future Wifey podcast on my phone while I'm going through chemo treatments. Right. Like that's what it looks like on the other side mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. When somebody is embarrassed because they had this, you know, their hair is just falling all off. Mm -hmm. um, and they go, that's my crown. The Bible says that a woman's hairs are crowned. And yes. that means I have no glory now that I've lost my right. crown. Right. And then they look at you and be like, but she's beautiful and she's going through the same thing. Restoration. So a queen isn't defined by mm -hmm. her hair. Mm -hmm. It's like NDRE song, I Am Not My I'm Hair. Not my hair. See, as a man, I really didn't understand that, but I would listen to the lyrics of that song and go, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. So it's, 
it's where we get to this place of healing where we can share our story, where we can share our journey so other people can elevate to the next level right. with a little bit of a little bit of hope underneath their wings, with a little bit of a faith underneath their feet to be able to take that next step into their purpose and their destiny. Mm -hmm. So that's what you did today. Thank you. That's Thank what you me. did today. And uh, it wasn't me. It wasn't yeah. Me. But you me. but you showed up. <laughs> you showed up. So the thing about it is, had you not showed up, mm -hmm. had you not been able to hear the voice of God and, and even seek God's voice and say, God, should I? God said, yes. You go, all right, I'm going to go. Yes. Had you got caught up in whatever you was getting caught up? Didn't you have a, did you uh, end up going to a dentist today? Did I you did. Th this morning I had a cavity filled. Yeah. Yes. And I had that and I had a cavity filled this morning. And he's like, but I'll be ready to go yeah, do that. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Again. Like, like some of the little things that would make people like, man, I went to dentist. I ain't finna go talk. I'm finna go home, finna go sleep. You know what I'm saying? Like whatever it is, yeah. people find whatever reason to, to, to. But when God says go, you go, you know, you go because you, one thing about life is our, our destiny has already been written. We just don't know the steps we have to get to destiny. We don't know. And so when God orders my steps, I put one foot in front of the other and I begin to walk and I begin to walk into my destiny. So I was predestined to be here. There it is. So I'm here. And whatever God is, is, is doing in my life, I'm allowing it because had I not, I wouldn't have been here. So I want you to look to that camera as we wrap up. The episode is called Tell the Truth. I want you to talk to the people and tell them the importance of just telling the truth. When we have to look at truth is not about anyone but ourselves. When you are being honest, it's all about you. It's not about anyone else. It's not about um, how this person is going to look at you. It's not about what they're going to say about you. It's how you look at you. And a lot of people say, I'm walking in my truth, mm. but they are really walking in their lies. And so when you are walking in lies, you move differently. And when you are faced with the truth, you don't know how to understand it. You don't know how to sit still. You become angry. You're ready to leave the area where it's not being lies. So when I say be honest with yourself, you have to literally, when you say, I am walking in my truth, that means I am walking in my honesty. I am walking in my transparency. I am walking in whatever I've been through because you cannot change that moment. It has already happened. It does not make me a bad person. It does not make me a good person to a certain extent because whatever I've gone through has enhanced my character and it has made me who I am today. So when you walk into your truth, people know when you are being honest. People know when you're being lied, lied, when you're lying to them. So when you walk into your truth, you're walking into peace, you're walking into love, you're walking into respect, you're walking into loyalty. All these things come with honesty. And all you have to do is walk in it. Stop walking in lies and learn how to walk in truth well spoken like a true queen listen my goodness uh how can people connect how can people connect with you um i'm on um tiktok i'm on facebook um it's um our what is cammy taylor 28 spelled backwards and i'll drop it in the, and, i'll drop it in the uh, and i do have a tiktok a lot of people know me from tiktok the funeral home lady the <laughs> funeral lady and um i'm not really i don't have a large following on instagram and i don't have a large following on facebook but i feel like um the people that need to know me they will find me and um they will spread the word but those are the only three um social platforms that good. i'm on good tiktok instagram we're gonna grow that instagram it's hard for people to cross platforms isn't it well i i never was i never looked at it like that because i was never on any of them so <laughs> i don't know if it's hard to grow them or not because i mean it was never my focus so, so how long have you had your instagram um i've had my instagram for some years because I, I, yeah a long time but i never was really active, just, on, it. active on it and facebook was just 
uh, it's that. But <laughs> I've only been on um, what you call it TikTok for two years. Yeah, right. So During this the is pandemic. the second year. This is the second year for me, and. I guess. Did it you shock know? you to see that many people listen to your stuff? You got a quarter million It folks. shocked me that this many people, they knew of me at one point and then they, they hated me and then now they received me. No, no we got to talk about that. Yes. We're we going to tell the truth. So they knew about you at one point. What happened where they found out about you? That when they found out about me, it was on Michael Bazin. Right. Um, and then Derek Jackson. Hmm, the infamous D. Um, <laughs> he did a video about me and he just took pieces of it and just turned it into what he wanted it to be. And he didn't know my full story. And so he made it seem as if I was just a, a weak woman, that I was just a lost woman. And he, he used it for his gain. And we know what happened with that. And then... God led me, and this is the thing. Well, I want you to say this: the video that that it was. What were you? Sh what 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 part of your story was you sharing? I was on. It was on Michael Bazin, and we were talking about relationships and how um, staying with someone after you know that they've cheated. I didn't know that the person was physically cheating. I just went through his phone and saw some text messages, and I just said he was cheating, and that was it. And so, even after I found out that I broke up with him and I stayed, you know, I went back, and then it it ended. And so, so he, what did Derek Jackson? He took the video. He and took said, the what? video and said, "See, women like this. Um, she's going through something. She's um, she needed his help. Um, she doesn't know her value. She doesn't know her worth. And when a woman goes through, and I'm like, what?" in the world i'm like this is not how this happened and so it went all over the world and and that video went viral that went it went all over in other countries it just went it blew up and i mean but you know what i, I stood my ground i have tough skin and i went through that and i took all of the negative things and i said you know what god i said you created me for greatness I said, and you know what? I said, this is not who I am. I don't care what he says about me. But when God turned that thing around, he gave me the opportunity to be on top. And I did a video that went viral. And it made it to ball alert. And I said, too much action, Jackson. And I'm just going to leave it right there. And I was able to redeem myself. But that was it. Was that was that during your TikTok moment, or was that before all that? This was during TikTok. So, so when you came back to redeem yourself, no, that's not... no, it happened when I was on Facebook. Okay, so the I first was one... able to redeem myself on TikTok. On TikTok. So God created a platform for you, and I spoke, and I ate them up. <laughs> and you know what? But that just goes to show you that you cannot put your mouth on what God has already touched. And when he touched me like that, God said, sister, I got your daughter. I got you. You just hold tight. And it was not, I did not, you know, it wasn't a happy moment, you know, because I was a woman. I felt her pain. I, every woman is his wife, Yeah. you know, and I didn't find glory in that, but I did make my video to show that keep your mouth off of what you are not living mm. and stop trying to gain off of the pain of women because he saw an opening in women. You all have to stop being drawn to every time someone says something positive about your pain because it is used mostly for their gain. His books, his platform was built off of the pain of women and he bamboozled women because he was the man that he was telling them to stay away from. And because they were in a Samson moment, they were looking for somebody to listen and give them what they didn't have and to agree with what they were going through. And Derek Jackson became that person. And they were Delilah and he was Samson. Hmm. He was trying to gain, he was the strength that they thought they needed. When he was really, to me, he was Delilah. 
To me. To, to me. He was Delilah. He so, was, wait, so what year did that video come out that you did the Michael Bazin thing? Like how, how? because I, I, I never seen any of it. So was, what was the oh, time span goodness. between? I think that was about maybe five years ago, maybe six, maybe years ago. So it was five years ago and then about. So that your video you came back, I called your redemption video. Was that in twenty? That happened whenever he got uncovered. Okay. Whatever he whenever he got uncovered, that video, I put it out and I didn't even know it had went anywhere until I got a call and my friend said, Hey, um, you you you've gone viral again. I said, Not again. You thought, you thought it was a bad thing? I was like, no. Well, I said, what did I do now? Because I put out so much material. I don't know what it is. And I'm like, ah. She said, oh, no, I not said, again. what did I do now? And she said, girl, that Derek Jackson video, you read him to the filth. And I was like, but you know, my heart went out to his wife. Because yeah. like I said, it wasn't to be mean because I'm a woman at the end of the yeah. day. You know, and I had to I had to get my lick back and I, I just felt like a little kid on the playground, but I wanted to get my lick back oh but my heart hurt for her in the mist. Yeah. Because I am a woman. And so I hope that they, you know, got things, you know, together and they've worked that thing out and I've always wanted to know. have him on the podcast. He on he normally don't do nobody. I've never seen him do an interview on anything. Selfish. I wanna see him come on here. <laughs> I wanna get Derek Jackson on my podcast. I wanna talk. But that that that's another thing. You may not be getting the truth. So take your chances. Pray about it. <laughs> I know I've See always God. Pray I wanted about Kevin it. Samuels on here too. Oh, so unfortunate. Yeah, I just I want I be wanting to hear brothers. I that, got his videos too. See, I be wanting people that say certain stuff. I just want to, you know, uh But you have to be careful with that because Derek Jackson built his platform off of lies. You know, and then they were like, well, he did say some good stuff, but it has no validation when you're not living it. That's an interesting thing. So you believe that when we say speak the truth, is the truth still the truth regardless of who's saying it? Or is it based upon the character of the person that's saying it? Because that's what hypocrisy is. You know, hypocrisy, of course, is saying something you're not living. So that's hypocrisy. But is it still truth? It taints the message. It does taint and it. I'm just going to leave it. Yeah, there. it does taint it. It taints the message. Facts. It taints the message because then you leave the door to open. Well, why would you listen to him? Because he ain't living it. It taints the message. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So if I'm going to get something, I want to get it from that couple that's actually living it. That's good. I want to get it from the people that are actually walking in what they are teaching. Good. I don't want to get it from somebody that is using it for his personal gain. I get it. Now. So it taints yeah. it. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want to hear anything he has to say. I get it. You know, and it's just like relationships. Yeah. When you get found out and you're lied to, the relationship is pretty much doomed because yep. I now I don't want to hear anything you have to say. That's true. So it goes back to that. Well, well, thank you. That, that's you good. That is, that is that is a, that's that's a good point. Yeah, you're it makes welcome. sense. So it you, taints you, you, it. You taint it. So it's no good. Kamish, let me tell you something. I've enjoyed talking to you. Ah, you're you. full of a wealth of knowledge and information. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, like I said, you just you just tell the truth. It is what just it is. Just tell the truth. And I mean, so, it's so easy. Life would be so much easier if people would just tell the truth. Relationships would go so much further if people would just tell the truth. And, and especially women. If they just really say, you don't fit my image. I just can't be with you. And men too. Just tell the truth. You think women do a lot of that? They're, they're... I know women do a lot of it because women's society has poisoned their minds with uh, images of a tall man, a handsome man, a this, that, and how he has to be this and that. Instead of me women saying, you know, you don't fit my image, they choose the word, I won't settle. <laughs> That's a cute way of saying you, you just don't fit my image. <laughs> and they won't tell the truth about it. Because you can have a man sitting over here, he can be five seven and he is a good man to you. He respects you, he honors you, yep. he provides for you, but he doesn't fit your image. Girl, you with that short man, da, da, da. and so you're so concerned about what everybody else is saying, and now you've missed a good man because guess what? You're so Worried about your image. And they won't tell the truth about it. Me in the same way. They want somebody young and vibrant and they won't tell the truth about it. You just, just don't fit the look that I want. 
That's it. Be honest. <sighs> Kamisa, I'm Be trying honest. to end this episode, but you end keep saying it. all Go this good on. stuff. No, it, you keep saying all this good okay, stuff. Okay, it was nice joining yeah. everyone today. Yeah, close it out and, for um, me. It was nice joining um, everyone today, and I'm honored to be here, and I thank him for having me on. And I hope that, you know, what I said reaches someone, even if it's just one person. I am not perfect, neither are you, but we strive each day to be what God wants us to be. Um, don't forget to pray, love somebody, tell somebody you love them, be a blessing to somebody. And y'all take care. Y'all give it up for Kamisha. <laughs> Yes. Ladarian thrusted suddenly into child protective services in 2015. My nephew, black, a boy. The likelihood of being adopted outside of kinship, slim to none. Armani, 16 years old, black, a boy, with five years in the foster care system before I even knew his name. The likelihood of ever being adopted, yep, you guessed it, slim to none. While Ladarian and Armani were trying to survive and barely thrive in an overpopulated and underfunded foster care system, I was living my own life, doing well professionally. Having been a single father with a daughter who at that point was doing well in college, it was my time to live my life, right? Wrong. I felt unsettled, tireless, agitated. There are just too many of our black children stuck in ambiguity and in the limbo of the foster care system. In 2017, I legally adopted my nephew, Ladarian. Fast forward to 2019, I had no ties to this other young king, but I felt God instructed me to adopt him also, and I obeyed. Starting over with parenting should have been enough, right? Working with various foster care and adoption agencies to help bring awareness to the countless young black kings in the foster care system should have decreased my agitation, right? Joining the board of directors of Advantage Adoption, an organization that helps find permanent adoptive homes for children in foster care, should have led to some type of resolve, right? No, not at all. None of it felt like I had done enough. I now realize that every one of those experiences was laying the fundamental foundation for my life's mission, Kingdom Royale. Kingdom Royale will be a luxury, state-of-the-art home for foster boys. Our first location will be in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We will utilize the whole person approach that instills identity, empowers them to advocate for themselves, and enlightens them regarding new perspectives and limitless options that they thought were impossible. Though the young kings will attend the local public schools that are in proximity to Kingdom Royale, our at-home curriculum will broaden their worldview through participating in the arts, attending various cultural events, learning about and engaging in multifaceted discussions about current events and even relevant historical contexts, introducing them to gardening and landscaping and even caring for our animals on our farm and on-site stables. We just launched our startup capital campaign with the goal of raising $2.8 million. Now, why $2.8 million? Well, in 2017, I created a web series in which I performed random acts of kindness for targeting the homeless community. One of the most notable successes was that one of the videos went viral, garnering 28 million views. However, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't raise a single dollar to help in implementing a more sustainable plan for the homeless community. So throughout the years, with much remorse, I reflected on not maximizing that moment. I knew if at that time, just 10% of the viewers donated $1, we would have raised at least $2.8 million that could have really established long-term support for the homeless community, or at least started a long-term initiative to do so. This is my do-over. This is our new beginning. Together, we can attack this at the root by specifically helping our homeless black boys who are already disproportionately represented in the American foster care system. I'm LaTaris R. Whitfield. I've been nominated for three regional Emmys documenting my work with the homeless as well as my personal adoption journey. Despite those accolades, the greatest award for me is truly providing the infrastructure for a transformed life. Visit KingdomRoyale.com for more details. Crown a king and make a donation today. Mm, 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 mm. 
when I tell you some episodes that just hit different, man, that it's such a pleasant surprise. Such a pleasant surprise. So, yeah. Dear future wifey, there's a war raging in the spirit realm. Demons have been dispatched to devise a scheme to destroy Christian unions. You and I will win the war. There was a time in my life when winning was all I focused on. I was ensnared by a toxic woman and no matter how much my heart bled, I fought to win. I held on with all my strength to the burning grasp of her hands. The longer I held on, the more the consuming fire scorched my heart. One day, I got a vision of you. And the smoldering flames assigned to destroy me were quenched by the insatiable quest to find you. My fight for toxicity transformed into a deep surrender of salvation. I understood without surrender, I wouldn't be rewarded to gaze upon your splendor. I no longer aim to win. My posture is submission. Through the submission to my father, I receive the ultimate reward, his blessing of you, his daughter, your future hubby. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Remember, be lit, live intentionally and transparently, and don't stop loving. Make sure to subscribe to our Dear Future Wifey YouTube channel. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. We welcome your support. Simply share our podcast with your friends and family.